Hello, everyone. Hope everyone doing fine and welcome to August and welcome to the introductions to color grading hands on with Max on webinar. So um, this let me share with you the format of this webinar. This webinar will consist of six sessions which run throughout August until September. And um, this will be different classes in e each of webinars. So it's not just one sessions repeated six times. So um, the scope of this webinar is we're aiming to help uh, the students and the beginner uh, colorist to develop their skill and knowledge about color grading. So throughout this six sessions of webinar, we will learn together about color grading, right? So um, my name is Max and I'm the trainer and resident colorist in Maxon. And today we are joined by uh, industry expert, another uh, guest that is Diego Yama. And instead of me um, introducing Diego, I think Diego, would you mind to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you so much, Max. And, and welcome everyone. I'm so happy to be here because this is going to be different as the usual lessons that we're going to do because it's going to be a class. So I love, I love like this format and we are going to enjoy it. About me, I live in Bogota, Colombia. I'm a colorist based here. I'm also a trainer, a master trainer for LATAM in DaVinci Resolve. I also work in educational purposes for Netflix, for Dolby. And, and that's me, I usually like to mix education and color. And I think when I mix both, is when I feel happy. So let's enjoy these sessions. Awesome, awesome. So um, without um, dwelling too much in the introductions because we have plenty to cover and we have limited time today, we will limit ourselves into like two hour sessions today. And um, let me help you to break down the sessions today. Um, in today's sessions, um, can everybody see my screen? You should see um, PowerPoint, by the way. Yes, we see it. Awesome. So um, in today's sessions, um, we will do um, some theory in the first, and I plan to do to cover some theory on color about 15 minutes. And then after that, we'll jump into the definitions of colorist, and Diego will walk you through, walk us through about that. And then we'll jump into the primary corrections and the secondary corrections. And hopefully by the end of the sessions, we all learn something. And this session is just a follow along sessions. If you want to follow along, you can do so by going to this page, Maxon um, event, and go to the introductions to color grading page. And there is a download project files, which leads you into Dropbox and here, there is a footage that you can download and use, and there's also the presentations and handout. Um, I suggest you to um, download the presentations part and also the recommended readings part, because um, on that um, particular um, resources, there are plenty of um, links that you can follow, and I think it can benefit you as well. So let us jump into the PowerPoint. So bear with me, um, we'll talk a little bit more about theory in the beginning, and then we jump into Resolve right after that, right away. So before we start um, doing color grading and color corrections, let us, let us understand a little bit about color. What is color? Color is a property of light, and without light, there is no color. And light comes from different light sources, and there are many different light sources out there, and we know sun as the most powerful one in the nature. And there are plenty man-made light sources, such as light bulb, candles, LED, so on. And the sun emits intense light, which appear to be white. And under the sun, if you are going out under a bright daylight, and if you are going to hold a white piece of paper, or if you are wearing a white shirt, the white sheet of paper or your white shirt will appear white under the sunlight. Meanwhile, if you are going to enter a dark room lit by a candlelight and holding the same white piece of paper, the white piece of paper will start to appear reddish. And why is that? This is because sunlight appears white because it contains all the visible colors 
and candlelight appears to be red because it only emits the light that mostly have reddish wavelength. So the question is, why do having all the physical color makes light white? So you're probably already familiar with this graph, especially if you're listening to Pink Floyd, the Dark Side of the Moon album. <laughs> but um, many years ago, Sir Isaac Newton found out that directed sunlight shine through a prism will refract different color. Now, the nice thing about this is that if we are going to divide this spectrum into two parts, take for example, the red, orange, and yellow, and into one color, into one group and green, blue, and violet into another group and collect that with a converging lens, the result will be two mixed colors whose mixture with each other in turn yields white. Now, two kinds of colored light whose mixture with each other yields white is called the complementary color. That's the term that we hear a lot, right? So the nice thing is that if we're going to isolate one hue from the prismatic prism, uh, prismatic spectrum over here, if we are going to take green out and collect the remaining with a converging lens, the result of those mixed color will be the opposite of green. Isn't that amazing? So understand this, that each spectral hue shown here is the complement of the mixture of all the other spectral hues. Now, scientists develop a 2D graph to easily help us visualize the color contained in any given light source. And this graph is called the spectral power distribution. The x-axis represents the wavelength of color. Meanwhile, the y-axis represents the intensity of that particular wavelength. So if we are going back to our example with a, a white piece of paper, you can see it, it's appeared to be white under the daylight because the daylight have complete wavelength, while the incandescent, similar to the candlelight, only emits the mostly reddish wavelength. Now, if you see carefully the fluorescent one, it only emits the green and yellow um, wavelength. So if you are going to take a, take a pictures with your camera under fluorescent light and set the white balance of your camera to daylight, you will have like this green tinge in your image because the fluorescent light doesn't have the complete uh, wavelength. So color is made of, of light as we already know before and light consists of different wavelength of energy. And when that energy comes through our pupil into our retina inside our eyes, it becomes nerve impulses signals and eventually get processed by the brain. So understand this, the light only exists out there in the real world, but the color exists inside your brain when we perceive it. So color is part physics and part human perceptions, right? And our eyes have this uh, photoreceptors in the retina, which are classified into two groups, which called the rods and the cone cells. Rod cells are highly sensitive to light, whereas the cone cells are sensitive to the specific wavelength of light. And we have three kinds of uh, cone cells, which is called the LMS. L stand for long wavelength, which is responsible for red. M stands for the medium wavelength, represent, uh, responsible for the green. And S for the short or the blue uh, wavelength. And upon doing my research, I stumbled upon that human apparently has three different visions. There are photopic visions, which is based on our cone only. And this is, this visions, all of this, it automatically kicks in when we are under certain lighting situations. And apparently we also have night visions, which is just based on our rod. So when we are standing in the lighting conditions below 0 0.001 candela per square meters, it's automatically kicks in. Our rod will be active while our cone will not. And there are, of course, the combinations of both. So um, without dwelling too much uh, for, uh, the, about the theory of RGB and James Clerk's Maxwell, let us just understand that James Clerk's Maxwell pioneered the discovery of RGB color model. and 
RGB color model is a color model that we've been using for over 160 years, and it's really important. And RGB color model is similar to what we have in our eyes, and it exists everywhere. It's inside our camera sensor, it's in the pixels of your display screen, and also in the, in the, uh, in the tools of our grading software, or the math behind all the color space transformations. Speaking of pixels, TV and computer monitors borrow the same idea of color receptor of our eyes. So if we are going to put a TV screen or the computer screen under a powerful magnifying glass, we'll be able to see that it's apparently made up of tiny rectangles which contain red, green, and blue region. And to display a certain region, the monitor illuminates these three colors accordingly. So for example, it won't, if it wants to, uh, to uh, portray or project green, um, yellow color, it will just emit the red and green regions. And then from afar, it blends in into yellow. And that is how we can digitally create any color using different amount of just red, green, and blue. Now, human visual system is most sensitive to wavelengths uh, from 380 nanometers to 780 nanometers. And light towards the middle of this range, the yellow and the green, is perceived as being most luminous. And at the extremes, below 380 or below violet, or what we call the ultraviolet, or above 780, or what we call the infrared, no matter how intense those lights are, it will be indistinguishable from black. We won't be able to see them. But know this, that there are animals out there that are able to see those spectrum, right? So now coming back again to our rods and our cone cells, right? Our rods sits on the periphery of our cones. And as a result, it gathers information from the sides. So for example, here an interesting experiment. If you go outside in a clear night and look at the sky, but don't go outside in the city, of course, uh, uh, search for um, you know light pollution's free area and go out there and try to search for a dim star and look directly at it. You know, under those uh, dark light, you know, your cones won't be active. You will not be able to see the object, but you still see the object, but not the color. So search for a dim star and look directly at it. It will appear dim. But then if you look slightly um, away from it, putting the dim star in your peripheral visions, it will appear much brighter. So why understanding this will help you? So let me give you a nice example here. Do you see Paint um, app, by the way? Yes, we see it. Okay, so here is your eyes, right? And we have human filter of view. And if we are grading on a monitor, for example, we know that there are some areas that is still covered by our eyes. And knowing that our peripheral visions are powerful and it plays some roles to our eyes, you need to make sure that those areas behind your monitor or surrounding your monitors neutral. So making those area neutrals is really important. Another thing, if you're grading your piece in the big projector and your filter view cover it like perfectly, but you have a subject on the screen left, you know, your screen right will be covered by your peripheral visions. So for example, if you have a complementary color or another source of light, you need to understand that those specific case need to be treated, right? So what I want to say actually is that understanding how human vision works can really save you time and get you into better positions when you are grading. So. Now let's move on quickly into the emotions of colors. We know that colors and emotions are closely linked and warm colors can evoke different emotions than cool colors and bright colors 
can create different feeling than muted colors. And knowing this, it can be used to trigger a certain emotions in the audience. So what I stumble upon, um, there is a great colorist out there. His name is Walter Volpato. Thank you, Walter, for sharing your knowledge with us. And um, I learned a lot from him. And um, upon learning from him, um, I realized that in color corrections, there are three things that you need to um, you need to uh, put it, um, how do you call it, understand. There are the technology side, and there are the observer side, and there are the culture side of it. And there are two elements surrounding te the technology of an image creations, the capture device and then the display device. Knowing how these things works will help you massively. So reading all the white papers, reading all the scientific um, articles about the display and the capture device will help you a lot in your journey. And then also understand that our work as a colorist is to help the director of photography convey emotions to the audience. And in this sense, it is also important to understand that if we create something that the observer or the audience will not be able to see, then, you know, it's probably a waste of time. And then um, the third and most important part is culture. You know, our audience watching the show that we color grade, they live in a society where a culture is already established. And therefore, in color grading, we need to always respect the culture of the audience we are targeting. Sometimes, color can symbolize different meaning in different culture, and a same color can represent totally different meaning. Therefore, therefore, always do your research and be careful of the use of color. Research and try. So, for example, um, take for example the the skin tone, right? Perfect skin tones will be different depends on the region where you live, right? Or look at the mo movie culture, how Malibu, Mexico looks certain ways. It always looks certain ways or how Moscow is always looks certain ways. Understanding these things will help you um, throughout your journey. So um, I think I'm reaching my end of time here, but um, before finishing it, um, there's a great, great book that I really would love to uh, recommend you to read. It's called, If It's Purple, Someone's Gonna Die. So I want to quote something from this book. We know that, uh, I think we are all familiar with the Technicolor, The Wizard of Oz, right? The old versions, not the, the new one. So think carefully. Do you think that it will work out if the brick road that lead to the palace was green, and if the jade palace was gray, and if the Dorothy shoe was yellow, do you think it will work? So yeah, you keep the answer. Um, I re really recommend you to check out the, the the book. So on that note, I will handle the uh, I will hand the presentations to Diego. Okay, it was really nice. It was really nice. And as you say, Max, something that we have to understand before color or before star grading is to understand how our eye see and that the colors are in the brain. This is something really important for for everyone to know and for us as a colorist to understand. Definitely, I see many things different as Max and Max see many things different as me. Yes. So I always think that a colorist needs to be a psychologist or uh, the guy that cut the hair, like to start asking what the client wants. So talking about that, let me let me share my screen. Wait a minute. Okay, do you see do you see result? No, wait, you have to see my PowerPoint. I will share it again and hey, wait. Okay, probably right now you see my PowerPoint there. There you go. Okay, so when we're talking about about okay, the what the colorist is going to do, definitely we need to think as the colorist as the person that is going to apply emotions to the story. This is something really really important. I always think that we we cannot write a script, we cannot edit 
some shots, but definitely we are like the music. We can provide emotions to the story. And this is something that we always have to think and have to apply to our stories. So what do you need to be a colorist? When Max were talking about the characteristics, like to talk about color, like it was technical, conceptual, I always think that a colorist needs to be an artist and a technician, definitely. And nowadays, the technician part is, is, is like taking some part. Why? Because in some way we are, we are a science or a discipline that is, do, is we made color using computers. We take advantage of cameras and we take advantage of the light captured by the cameras. So definitely we need to know about the ARRI cameras, the red cameras, how they produce. We need to know about codecs. We need to do, know about gamuts, color science. But also, if we just know about it, we will be an engineer. We need to apply to that capture image something aesthetic that will produce emotion to our images. And that's where the artists come. Definitely, we need to check about the different color harmonies that art provides us all around the history. And knowing about it, we can apply it. But a colorist is a person that needs to mix both things. So I want to show you something really important that a colorist also needs to take care of is, I always say, don't throw so much into your eyes, especially if you are starting. It's like ice is like, imagine that you are making, I don't know, you are running. It's like you have to practice, 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 and then you will become a better runner. With the eye will be the same. Why I'm saying this? So let's check this image so fast. And I'm sure many of you right now are, are like thinking, okay, it's, it's a blue image, but I know what are the colors of this image. I know that the banana is yellow. I know that the apple over there is green. I know that the strawberries are red. So that's because of what Max said. We have a memory of colors. We have a memory of colors. Our eye in some way is showing us that all is blue. And this is our, what our eye is saying. But definitely, I mean, we have some colors in our, in our, like in our mind that in some way needs, that everyone has some difference, but we need to discover them. Okay, so that's about memory of colors and that's what a colorist needs to do or needs to understand in order to create an image. But when we are starting to create an image, I always think that we need to divide. We need to divide the image. And when you divide it more, you can like specialize, specialize more or achieve your objective. So what this means? First, we are start talking about color grading and color correction. So this is something that in our culture, we are like in, I mean, we divide it. I usually don't divide it because for me it's, it's the same. So we say like color grading is the more artist, artistic part. Color correction is the most technical. But I always think that when we are grading, we are using our subjective way to see uh, the things and we are doing in some way a grading part. But that's something that you have to take care about. But before you start grading, you need to know two differences. The first one is a primary and the second one is the secondary color correction. So here is a great definition that Max put in our presentation. It's about Steve Hulfish. Steve Hulfish has a great book. It's called about the art and technique of digital color correction. It's a great book for starters. Also, it's a, I don't know, 200 pages books about waveform. It's really great. And one of the things that I remember when I started like following him is that I was like looking at a, at scopes, at tectronics scopes and so on. And he was making a presentation when he was mixing how to read the scopes and how to use it in grading. And here in this book, he, he wrote a great presentation that a primary correction is the process of setting the overall tone contrast and color balance of the image. 
and secondary some additional steps that refine the image in a specific geographical regions of the image or a specific color vectors. So based on that, I want to like put this in a really easy way to understand it. And let's think, for example, that we have to paint a room, a white room, and this white room, we will paint it in yellow or in blue. We will use primary, in some way, primary brushes for paint all of that room in blue or to paint all of that room in yellow. That will be primary brushes, a really, really big primary brushes. But let's imagine that we need to paint this part, this is more parts. If we are using these big brushes, like to paint that part, we cannot. So we need to use a small brushes. And that's where the secondaries come. The secondaries are the tools that will paint that small part of the wall. And that's about color. Always we start with primaries, then we go with secondaries. And talking about it, I always like, probably, I mean, when you listen to me, I always try like to relax, like to think color and to make, to think as something similar as cooking or to think as something similar as flying. So for example, sometimes I think that grading, color grading or color correction in some way is similar as when you are a pilot. So for example, let's think that I'm in Colombia and I need to fly to where, my Maxon, where Max is and where Maxon is also to Germany. And I always think that, okay, I need to go there. How can I go there? I mean, if I'm a pilot, probably I will just have this room. In the sky, they don't have highways, they don't have anything. They don't have anything like to go from one country to another one. How can I do that in color grading if Max already told us that in some way the eye see capture the like the light, but the brain is the one that like understand uh, the things we see. So I always relationate that if our eye in some way give us like different perception of the images and also like in some way is not completely accurate, I always think that a colorist needs to be like a pilot that is in the sky. A pilot in the sky cannot use the eye. Or yes, he will use the eye, but he will use all of his knowledge. So let's think that we are a pilot, but we are not in this airplane. We are in a grading room, but we have our radars, our GPS, and these are the scopes. The scopes are the only tool, in some way, the most trusted tool that we have to achieve one objective. It's the same as the pilot. So let's quickly review fast, really fast, how the waveforms work. And let's think of something. Always think that you are a pilot and that you are in the sky and the most like precise way to achieve objectives is using the scopes. So for example, here I have one, one title that is called Maxon, as you notice here. And the first scope that we have is the waveform. So the waveform, in most of the cases, you will see that it's a graphic of luminance and everyone's told you about that it's a graphic of luminance. But if you notice, for example, if I put it here, I have the image and I have the max zone word. So probably right now you are thinking, okay, but if, if, I, if it's just luminance, why I see exactly the same I'm looking at here? So the reason is that the waveform is a graphic of luminance in Y, but it's also a graphic of position in X. And because I have a title that use a gradient, that's the reason that I see the text here. So let's think at the waveform as a graphic of luminance versus position. It's really, really important to understand how, ma how many luminance or how much luminance we have in an image and where that, ima or where that luminance is located. For example, here I have a great scale. And the reason I see a diagonal line here is because this is a gradient that goes from black to white and from left to right. That's the reason. 
There are also some scopes that are really important. Let me explain you really fast the parade. So if I go to the parade, let me put here some, some more light. I see exactly the same, but the parade is the show us the division between red, green, and blue. So what this means that if I see something white and black, red, green, and blue are going to be exactly the same with the same proportion. But if I start to mix in the colors, let me show you here and start moving. I start to make the image reddish. So that means that the image is going to be complete, but also the RGB is going to show me that reddish in the image. Also, I can start mixing and I can see which color is more predominant in our image using the RGB parade. So the RGB parade is a graphic of, let's think about the quantity of luminance per each color capture or display uh, in a software color, in a software color, in a color software system. So let's think about, for example, this one. So here I have a red solid, and the composition of this red solid is that it has a lot of red, a little bit less of green, and a middle of blue, something like that. So this is the parade. But we have another one that I use a lot also, that is the vector scope. The vector scope, I always look at the vector scope, or I always say that the vector scope is like a really ugly color wheel. Because in some ways, it's like it's monochrome, but it's so similar. So the vector scope is showing us the color, where the color is located. As you notice here, we have red, green, and blue, and how much color we have, how much color we have. If I move here to another one, I see that we have more of blue. Here we have yellow. And if I start like increasing color, this point will go more to this part of the circle. If I don't have color, this will go to the center. So in this really short explanation, the main idea of like the scopes here is that you need to use all of this, as you will see, to get effective resolve in color grading. And we will learn how to use it. Well, thank you very much, Diego. That's such a really nice explanation about the scopes. And um, I hope everyone understands how to use the scopes. And um, yeah, that's really great explanations of the scope. Thank you. And um, let me share my screen now. Um, Okay, hold on. I need to make myself presenter. Yeah, and definitely right now, I mean, we, we have talked theory at this beginning of the class. This next session is going to be more about we are going to do that in Resolve. Yes. So for you guys that you are thinking, well, it was so fast, don't worry. Right now we are going to calm down a little bit and start using the tools in Resolve so you can also follow us. Yeah. The idea is to cram everything theory related a little bit faster in the beginning so we have more time to play in resolve <laughs> yes also if you have questions you can ask us in the chat and we will answer it. yeah so um if you uh if you see the the links that i posted previously you can download the same timeline uh, and use it inside resolve or you can also create your own timeline and uh, using the same footage that I provided. And also bear in mind that in this um, PDF, I also mentioned that I will be using uh, sample footage from BMD camera or RED camera or ARRI camera. And you can download it uh, yourself uh, using this link and it will um, redirect you into that uh, page. So as we know, uh, there are always two key aspects when it comes to creative work. The creativity itself, and then the technical aspects. So we will not cover the creativity uh, aspects because you know it's not uh, the, it's not the scope of this sessions. And the technical part, however, in color grading, it involves fixing things and making things controllable. So in today's sessions, we will just dedicate our time to do just that. It is very important 
to have control and overview of your work before you introduce any further complicity, before you start inter introduce any creative aspects of your um, looks. And in color grading, it starts with balancing in the primary corrections. We know that primary corrections is the corrections that affects the overall tone of the image and it sometimes include the uh, color balance and then setting up the contrast, right? So balancing is like preparing a canvas before you start painting or yeah, putting a primer in your canvas before you start painting. And it can serve you as a glue to your look that you will create later on. And again, to steal a quote from Robbie Carman from Mixing Light, color grading is part of post-productions and anything post-productions related, experimentations is always a key. So I do really encourage you after watching this webinar to go ahead and just try to discover things by, your, um, by yourself and use the recordings of this webinar as a as a guidance to redirect you into the the directions that you can uh, experiment so in today's sessions we won't be doing anything flashy but i really hope um for you if you don't know how to use the tools inside resolve i hope you can really benefit from the sessions okay okay let's start and when we are color grading we normally opt to work with a image with um, high dynamic range or the wide latitude, because we will be able to uh, wiggle. Um, we have we will have a wiggle room, right? And we know that log image um, hold such a, a great dynamic range, and that's why we normally want to work with log image. But there's nothing wrong if you work with a Rec 709 image, for example. But in this case, we have a log image. And normally when we see log image, when we preview uh, our log image on our computer screen, it will look something like this. It's quite flat and desaturated. And that happens because the image has such a wider color space. The camera capture the image in a wider color space. Meanwhile, our display cannot project the same color that captured by the camera. And the information of the log image are widely compressed. And so that's why the process of normalizations in the primary corrections is needed. That is to make the image to look normal. And to do so, we normally um, adjust the contrast, the saturations level, and the, the, temp, uh, the temp and tint. And the most basic form that we, the most fundamental form that we normally see is the to manually um, adjust the contrast by either playing around with the contrast and then play around with the pivot and also do the saturations adjustment and the temperature and tint control. I mean, of course, it doesn't look good at the moment. I just want to um, show you an example. So if we see in that process, what are the process behind it? There are three processes, right? The contrast adjustment, the temp and tint adjustment, and then the saturations adjustment. So let us talk about contrast. Let me reset the image first. What is contrast? So contrast can be understood as a, as a difference or distance between light, this one, and shadow. And here I have a waveform to, to, to show you that the image goes from black to white linearly. And when somebody is making a contrast adjustment, they are either increasing or decreasing the distance between highlight and shadow. So in modern color correction suite like Resolve, there are plenty of ways of creating a contrast. And um, as you can already see, uh, before we are creating a contrast using the contrast and pivot button. So what do the contrast and pivot button do? Contrast, by adding a contrast, as you can see in the waveform and uh, in the preview itself, I am, by increasing the contrast, I am deepening my shadow and brightening my highlights. 
while it is retaining the blacks and the white without clipping. That is the contrast button do. And what is the pivot button do? Pivot balances the contrast by putting a priority in either side of the luminance scale. So by dragging the pivot button to the right, I am putting priority into the shadow area. And if I'm dragging the pivot to the left, I'm putting priority to the highlights. So you can understand this, that um, pivot button move the, the balance point of the contrast, right? Double click to reset it. Now, that is one way of creating a contrast. And what is the other way to create contrast inside Resolve? Well, as you can see, we also have curve adjustment. And curve is similar to, um, to um, how do you call it? It displays the image from left to right, and it goes from black to white. It's similar to what you see in the waveform. So if we are going to introduce the same um, contrast like we saw previously by establishing a point somewhere in the lower range and drag it down and then establishing another point somewhere in the upper third and dragging it up, we pretty much introducing the same contrast like we did before. And that is what curves do. And another way to create a contrast, as if two methods are not enough, there is another way to create a contrast that is using by, uh, by using the lift and gamma gain. And you can do so by creating, uh, by playing around with the master wheels and deepen your shadow and also increasing your gain. But can't you see that it is giving you this result compared to the previous one with a contrast button, we have a, a soft fall off when using contrast button. Meanwhile, with a lift gamma gain, we have that. And this is actually a settings that you can change in Resolve. Um, that is by going to project settings that is using the cock wheel over here. And if you go to the general options, and if you check, if you uncheck use S curve for contrast and press save, you will see that the contrast behave similarly, right? So let me just re, uh, turn on use S lock, uh, S curve for contrast. There you go. And if you notice, before I was using the master wheels, but there's another way of using this uh, wheels, the primary wheels, that is by using the luminance only or the Y only channel. And this is, can also be done in curves by separating this and just using the Y only. So what is the difference uh, between master wheels and the luminance only? Let us go to our image and let's see. So as you can see, if I am going to deepen my shadow using master wheels and increasing my brightness my, uh, using my gain wheel, and I will disable this and create another node. And in the second node, I will just use the Y only and deepening my shadow and increasing my brightness. Now, you, I hope you see the difference, right? The master wheels includes all the other color channel. So the red and green and blue color channel is also affected and effectively increasing the contrast level, uh, the saturation level of the image. Meanwhile, if you're just using the Y only, notice that the color channel is not affected. You have the similar contrast, but not the saturations. So when will you use the Y only adjustment? I think this is a great tool when you want to create, uh, when you want to increase the contrast without um, making, increasing the image colorfulness, right? So that are some ways that you can create contrast. And um, it doesn't mean that 
in one project or in one image, you need to use all this tool, all these tools that I show you to achieve one contrast. I do really suggest you to just get familiar with these tools and pick the one that you feel comfortable with. Because when you go, when you are comfortable with your tools, you will get the most out of your work. And that and is the add, contrast adjustment. I will yes, add something, Diego. Max, that you say you were testing the tools and looking at the waveforms. That's the only way yes. for you to know what is happening. And we are using Resolve, but we can use the same technique in Premiere, in Best Light, exactly. in Scratch. And I always think that no matter which tool you are using, you need to know what your tool is going to do, what leaf is going to do, what offset is going to do. Yeah. So I encourage you, if you move to Premiere, to Final Code, to some other, to bring that gray scale and start exactly. making the same test that Max did. It is it is really good test to help you to understand uh, the tools that you are using. So if you don't know how to create this grayscale, by the way, in Resolve, it is very easy. If you go to edit page, and um, you see here in the effects library, if you turn on effects library, you can just drag and drop grayscale into your timeline. And then after that, you just right click and, let me just do it, wait a second. Let me just do it right here. And you create new compound clip and rename it. And by so, by creating a new compound clip, the same grayscale ramp will be showing in the color page. Yes. That is contrast. And I yeah. also like to add one thing that is important. As you notice, Max start like experimenting with light. This is something really important. We We see more light than color. So as you notice, it, like most of our first step when we are grading is to manipulate light. Yeah. And that's where we have the contrast, all of the tools. So I think I think divided. I forgot to cover that in the presentations. <laughs> the really. luminance and the color is processed separately in our brain. And um, knowing that in our eyes, we have way much more Roth's cell, which is responsible for the luminance way much more compared to the cone cells. We have round about 100 millions of rod cells compared to 6 millions of cone cells. So I think it's fair to say that we are more sensitive to luminance. Yes, and, and definitely that's one, the first, more, one of the, our first step is to start experimenting with contrast, luminance, and how much luminance we can apply it or we can yeah. reduce to our image. So, Moving on, we already discussed about the contrast. Now let's see the second adjustment that we just made before. That is the temp and tint adjustment. But temp, again, I'm, I will be using the grayscale ramp to show you what and tint control do. So for example, if you are moving temp and tint control, if you observe what is happening in the waveform scopes, you see that it moves the data, but what did you see? The black point remains neutral. It pivots on the black point, right? And not just that, if I am going to use vector scope and play around with a temp and tint control, it moves the data along specific axis. So temp and tint move the data along orange and blue axis, while tint control move the data between magenta and green. Combine that information with the, the one that we did with the waveform scopes um, that the black area is not affected. It mostly affected the highlights and the white. You can use these tools to affect the white balance of your image, balancing the white or making the white white or making the neutral looks neutral, right? And Another thing is the saturation adjustment that we did previously. And to do so, let us move here in this image. And as you can see, saturation adjustment, what saturation do is that if I'm going to put all saturations to zero, it compresses everything 
into the middle means that if you have black and white image in vector scope it will lift right there in the middle meanwhile if you are going to blow the saturations up as you can see it just take all the all the colors in your image and without judging oh i will put more priority in this and that no it will just take any color all available color and just boost it that is the saturations uh button so now let's move on into the process oh wait a second before we moving on <laughs> we already see the the master wheels in the lift gamma gain previously right but we haven't seen what's under the hood of the lift and gamma gain wheels so again to do so we will use our best friend waveform and if you can see if i'm playing around with the lift wheel and if you put a close observations lift wheel affects everything from the black to the shadow to the highlights but it pivots to the white points so white points remain untouched meanwhile gain wheel do the opposite it adjusts your image linearly but the black point remains untouched now the interesting one is the gamma the gamma affects everything non-linearly but half the zero or the black and the white point unaffected so that's a little bit of uh, lift gamma gain but and that 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 tools have like wide range of coverage and those are called the primary wheels and remember the primary corrections the overall tone of the image so as you can see it covers like really huge overlap the 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 tools have huge overlaps between each other but there are another wheels inside resolve that similar to primary wheels and it's called the lock wheels and lock so, wheels behave a little bit different than the lift gum again so for example if i'm playing with shadow you see it's not pivoting in the white it's pivoting somewhere in the middle right there and if i'm going to play with a highlights wheel you can see it's also pivoting somewhere there in the middle and the mid-tone wheels will be affecting the area with the pivots of the shadow and the pivots of the highlights and what's nice about uh lock wheel is that you can change this pivot button pivot area using the high range high range or low range so the low range uh, affect the area between the shadow and the mid-tones so you can move it or the high range it affects the area between the highlights and the mid-tones so you can do so and why knowing this is important here is a interesting case normally when we are grading like the very famous one is like the you know we we cool down our shadow by increasing by uh, putting by introducing a, a cool tinge in our shadow area and then we also increase the warm tinge in the in the highlights area right knowing that we can um, target those specific area using lock wheels we can try to make our uh, shadow and highlight a little bit more balance sorry i will delete this and shift s to create a node before that so here if i'm going to introduce a uh, opposite color of the one that I introduced with a lift wheel. I introduced blue to the shadow. So now we'll just introduce the opposite color. Notice that the black is coming back. So before and after. That is how you can use um, um, log wheels and lift gamma gain wheels um, in practice. So I really suggest you, I really urge you to play around on your part and to discover how you can use uh, those wheels in a different scenario. So let me reset this. Now let's move on to the balancing part, right? Um, we know that we are working with a log image. Now the question is, where should the balancing happen? We know that where we're, when we are working with a log image, we somehow need to preview it correctly. 
And there are many ways to, um, to, try to preview the image correctly. One, we can do it manually, or two, we can use what we call the color management to help us to transform our image from you know, looking flat like this and to look a little bit more appetizing, to look normal. And one simplest way to, to do that without going deeper into color management, let understand that we can do so by using the lookup table to convert the color space of one, um, one color space to the display color space. So um, if lookup tables is just a collection of numbers that tells your software to transform the RGB, the RGB pixel values into specific um, value, right? So to use LUT in Resolve, you can just right click, go to LUT, and then I, since this was shot with Blackmagic Design, so I, um, I will choose the the Blackmagic Design LUT, and in this case, the Gen 5 film to extended video. And boom, voila. And by creating, um, now the, the, the questions before, coming back to the questions before, where should the balancing, balancing happen? It is always best to do your balancing before your image transformations. So to give you a simple explanation is that if I'm going to put the LUT here, so for example, just let's just use the ARRI Alexa and create a node before and create a node after. So for example, if I'm working after the LUT, for example, if I'm increasing offset, look how easily, oh, sorry. I should select this node first and look, just by tweaking it, I can clip my image very easy. But if I'm working before the LUT, it somehow try to preserve the contrast ratio and you will not get clipping very easy. This is because you are working in a wider dynamic range before it was converted by the LUT. And this terms in the colorist um, circle, it is called the working under the LUT or before the LUT. So the things that I haven't explained you before is the offset wheel, right? Um, we have another wheel that is the offset wheel. And if we, if we see in, in a vector scope, what offset wheel do is it will, it will move everything, the data, without pivoting anywhere. So it means that by changing our offset, it means that we are not changing our contrast ratio, right? So let us go back to our image and try to balance it. So I will create a node before that. And, you know, um, before the LUT, if you don't like the contrast ratio of this image, you can still create a contrast that you like, right? But in this case, as we already learned before, that offset wheels move everything up without changing the contrast ratio, that is also a, a, a method that you can use to increase the exposure of your image without changing the contrast ratio. And here, let us just do that. So, as I say before, um, balancing is to make like um, the image um, as normal as possible. So, how do we decide how to balance and how do we decide if an image is balanced? So one way to do that in Resolve is that you can measure your image by using a qualifier. And if you right click in your preview, check show picker RGB value, and you will be able to see the pixel value where you hover overing at. So for example, we know that the concept of balancing is to make the neutral looks neutral. And in this case, you can try to measure your image on the white part. If you have a white part or a gray part or a black part, that would be perfect. And in this case, we have a white part. And if we switch to parade, we can already see that the blue level is higher compared to the green and compared to the uh, red. 
So one thing that you can do to balance your image, you can either play with the temp and tint control, but there is another settings, another, uh, another tool that you can use that is the auto balancing. By using this eyedropper, and for example, if I'm just clicking the flag over here, and re-measure it, I got a closer value than before, right? So what is our objective here? Our objective here is to bring the these values as close as possible, but having it match right in the middle, you can do it, but you know, coming back again to our principle, if the audience will not be able to see it, do we want to do it, right? And um, that is one uh, one thing, one principle when you are um, balancing your image. Um, the first and foremost is to achieve neutral highlight and shadow and making thing, neutral things look neutral. But here is the case. What if you have something with the, uh, some, some, some clips with human in it? And this will lead us into second principles. Although you can make your image look neutral, as neutral as possible and makes those um, white area or the neutral area as neutral as possible, sometimes it is also important to get your memory colors looks correct. What are the memory colors? Those are memory colors that we know by default it looks in certain way. The sky has to look blue, for example. Otherwise, yeah. if it looks violet, you'll be in Mars or somewhere. And um, the foliage should look green. And we have great memory of skin tones. Yes. And you can try to balance. For example, here, I already put a lot to normalize my image. You can try to balance your image so by using the auto balance here and having uh, and having um you know the auto balance do the do the job sometimes you get a great result like this i'm having a great result so for example if i'm showing you in vector scope sorry and i will just limit my skin tone to show that in the scope so if i'm Let me just limit my area of view into the skin tone only. So, and I switch on the highlight mode. If you try to see here, let me zoom it twice so we can see it. Vector scope is already on the top right there. So another thing that you can try to balance your image to looks nice is by putting a priority to memory colors. And in this case, we already see that the memory colors living in the eye bar close to the, where skin tones lives. Doesn't matter what ethnicity you are, skin tones live in this area, plus minus 10 degree, right? So for example, if I want to make the skin tones more, uh, looks more healthy, healthier, I can increase uh, the red channel a little bit, increase some red to make it uh, closer to the red, or I can just decrease the green to make it moving closer to the middle. So this would be before and after. I hope you can see that, that the skin tones look fuller than before, right? So there's another uh, school of thought when you are balancing. You, you can either try to achieve the neutral thing to look neutral, but you can also try to put priorities into your memory colors. Now, this is where subjectivity plays an uh, important part, right? So there is the subjectivity part in your technical aspect. Well, I hope this um, short explanation helps you understand the balancing process. Now, the question is... And I, will, right, I, will, yeah. I will add one thing, Max, if right, we... As a colorist, we, we have the same objective as a photographer. So we have the main objective is to create perspective. Perspective. We see in 3D, but in our image, all of our images are 2D. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is we need to create depth. We need to create a lot of depth. 
So when you balance an image, you create depth. And also when you start moving the lights inside the image, you create depth. So that's also some, something that you have to be in mind. Create perspective, create perspective, simulate depth. That's, yeah. I, I always think that's, I mean, emotions is perfect, but always depth, think of depth. We're working in the 2D space, <laughs> right? Exactly. Thank you very much, Diego. That's a very nice addition. So um, the question is, what if you're not using Resolve? What if you're just using um, your NLE, for example, Premiere Pro? So let us jump into Premiere Pro and showcase that, right? Let me open Premiere Pro. Bear with me. I should have opened it before and have it prepared. <laughs> yeah, but what they have to think is they can use any software and make the same test. The exactly. difference is you will notice is that there is like something under the hood for each software in the tools. The but concept I mean, is just yes. the same, right, Diego? The concept is the same, yes, definitely. So here we are in Premiere Pro and I have exactly the same clip as before. But the thing is like here, I have a gradient ramp. Um, you probably ask, like, how do you create great gradient ramp in Premiere Pro? So one method that I use is that by creating a black video, you can do so, you go to your project tab here and create a black video and drop that black video to your timeline, to your sequence. And then on that black video, you have to choose it. You can put a ramp effect. Just type in ramp and you have generate ramp and you just apply it. Uh, one thing that you notice, instead of going from left to right, the ramp goes from top to bottom. And you can do so by just dragging the control point to left and right, right? And one thing that I do is that I just nest the clip. Like that. So we'll just delete that, I don't need that. So um, to show you the same stuff in Premiere Pro, one thing though um, that I want to um, give you like a tip here, when you're working in Premiere Pro uh, to color in Premiere Pro, I think this is really nice options that you need to have. Look, as I'm moving between clips, it select the clips um, automatically. And you can uh, turn on that options by going to sequence and have the selections follow playhead active. So, um, here I will try to showcase you with the Magic Bullet Colorista, what we have just did in Resolve. And in Magic Bullet Colorista, we have three uh, color wheels. That is the shadow, mid-tone, and highlights. If I'm playing around with the shadow, you can see similar to lift uh, wheels, it is affecting the area in the shadow and the black, but it's pivoting to white. And it is just the same with the mid-tone wheels and the highlights wheel, something like that. So I trust you to do your own test in your own time. And um, let me show you the process of balancing. Uh, and throughout this process, I will use Magic Bullet Suite because that's, that's where I feel most comfortable with and I really like it. So yeah. To search for um, Magic Bullet Suites, you can simply just type in bullet in the effects. Magic Bullet Suite contains seven different uh, tools to uh, create looks and also to color correct your images. We will, uh, in this in the sessions today, we will just use Colorista to showcase our uh, balancing process. So similar to uh, what we did in Resolve, you can achieve the same thing by normalizing your image manually, reducing the shadow, deepening the shadow, increasing the highlight, playing around with the mid-tones, or increasing the exposure or reducing the exposure, and then, you know, do the white balance, something like that, using the same auto white balance um, tools. There's possibility for you to do that manually, but, in Colorista, there's another way to do that because um, why not? And in Colorista, there's a um, specific tools that called the guided color corrections that lives here. 
inside uh, Colorista. And if you use this, it will prompt you with a different with a another pop-up windows, and it will ask you if your if your clip is shot in video format or flat video or lock. And in this case, I have a lock image, and I will just choose lock image. And then you will have a black and white versions of your image. And then you first will be asked to adjust the black levels, right? If you adjust it way too far, you will see the clipping in blue. And there's a suggestions from uh, guided color corrections as well. And the second step will be adjusting your white level. See? If you do it, overdone it, you will see a red clipping, but you can still um, fix that later on after finishing the guided color corrections. You can still tweak the parameters. So it's not destructive process. So let me then, let me say something, Max, that yes. you say. This tool is so amazing, and this is usually the, the step that we do. We were talking about light and that the eyes see more light. So as you notice, what is doing this tool is putting uh, the image in black and white, and it's giving you, when, when it's the image in black and white, it's like your eye gets focused just in the light. And this is something really important for you to know what are the parts that you are going to see, what are the closed parts or the clipped parts. So it's a great process that we can do also manually, but these tools make it for, to you automatically. And it also makes something that the cinematographers use in real life, that is the false color. That is when you have clipped highlights, there is going to be like a red outline in the image. And when you have closed blacks, there is going to be a, a blue, a blue, like a blue part in the image. So it's mixing two great tools for exposure. That is great black and white, and also the false, the false color tool. Yeah. That's great. So the idea you will have the contrast, uh, the good contrast ratio without uh, being disturbed by the levels of um, color contrast in the image, for example. So next adjustment is the midtones and then the contrast ratio, as you can see here. And now you can introduce the saturations level to your image, right? And what's nice here, you have the color balance. Now, you can do it automatically using the color picker here, and you can pick the neutral gray area. Or if you have something with a, a clip with a, with a subject, with a human subject, you can also use skin tone indicator. So you can just click the skin tones and it will try to match the skin tone. And um, remember, I'm talking about the memory color before. And we have the memory color um, indicator inside um, guided color corrections as well. So if you see the sky are blue and then the green foliage is green, so you're pretty much safe because it shows as it is. And now another thing is that you can use the vector scope and play around with the data and adjust to your liking. And as you can see, the gray will be shown as gray. And that's literally it, how you do the image balance in uh, Magic Bullet Colorista. And by default, it's applying a universal LUT, a universal lock LUT in the Colorista. But although the LUT is applied here at the top of Colorista, it is still processed right after the very last tools in Colorista. So that is uh, balancing using guided color corrections. Another way to do that, I'm sorry if I'm going too far with this, Diego. Um, no, another way that you can do that, we know that previously we use um, specific LUT to balance our image, right? We can we can do exactly the same things because you all, you also can work with LUT uh, inside Colorista. So, for example, if I'm if I want to use the Black Magic LUT Generations Five uh, for this specific image specific uh, clip i can hit choose a lot and there you will have a lot windows and you can import your lot and you can point out to the lot locations that you have in this case i already imported it and i can start using it so for example this is the black magic 
Gen 5. Now I can use this. And then now I can do a minor tweak to my liking. So for example, I know that I want to tweak the exposure level and I can white balance my image the same like I did previously. And now, if you want to apply the same similar things to, um, to the next clip, in Colorista, you can generate another LUT, but you can also save everything as a preset. So when you are generating a LUT, there's a, uh, how do you call it, a warning here. Um, when you are generating a LUT, all the secondary corrections will not be in, in, included in the LUT. So for example, vignette or uh, keying or something will not be able to be included in the LUT. So another nice thing to use that, uh, to use um, shareable format is to use a preset and you can just save a preset, name it, uh, specify the folder name and click save. And in the next clip, I can just drag and drop Colorista and choose a preset, search the preset, and start using it. And if I want to tweak further, I can still do that because it's a preset. So that is several options for you to um, balance your clip inside uh, Premiere Pro using Magic Boot Colorista. So I hope um, the session's um, helpful for you to um, to redirect you into your own um, experimentations, further experimentations. I'd recommend you to play around with the tools using the uh, grayscale ramp, test your tools. And by doing that, by doing the experimentations, you will discover a lot, okay? So um, on that note, I will hand the presenter baton to Diego. Thanks, thanks, Max. So yes, it's you. You are like looking um like a fast track on how to do like most of the things, but definitely you have to take some time after this class like to start experimenting, and that's our main objective: start experimenting and always do the things logically. I think that's the most important. We usually when we start grading, we move everything, and suddenly we have a good result. But the problem of grading, not the problem, our work in grading is that we don't do word image. We have to replicate that in many images. So that's the reason that we need to do what, what, what we do. And we need to predict the images. In many ways, what I do is before like touching the, the color grading software, I think what tools that I what tools I need to use what the results are going to be and then i touch the controls so that's something that that i usually like to do so okay so in this last part i will i will actually like touch one of the most important things in grading and definitely is the most important one that is matching matching is everything in color grading as i told you and i always say we are not that colorist for instagram Definitely, we can upload some image to Instagram and so on to show them that they are great. But our scope or our target is not Instagram. Our target is a sequence of shots that they need to be really, really similar. So let me let me start with actually with these like solid colors. And what I will do is start matching them. And then we will start matching then some of our some of our images that you have here. Okay, so let's, for example, let's think that we have this blue that is a little bit green. Is that blue green? The first thing that I'm that I'm thinking when I'm saying. So remember, the only thing that gives you or the only tool that gives you certainty about what color you are looking are the scopes. So let me open the scopes. I will open the scope and I will, in this case, because it's a color, 
I will look at my vertex, vector scope and definitely this color is a blue in this part with a little bit of green and it's a cyan color. It's the only way I know because the monitor can show me something, the eye can show me something. The only thing that I can trust are my friends, the scopes. So let's save this shot, grab still. Let's go to another shot. Let's go to this green one. So how can I match these two shots? So the first tool that we usually do to match shots is, or the first like thing that we need to think is don't trust in your memory color. Your memory color is in some way will we'll send you to another part. So for example, what is the memory color? I look at this and then I look at here and then I start to match it. And I think that is matched, but if I go back here, no, it's not matched. So don't think in your memory color. Use the tools that the software are, uh, is giving to you to match the colors. So the first tool is the wipe. So what I did was, I grab a steel, right click, and then grab a steel. Then I came here. And what I do is select this one, image wipe. So the image wipe is going to give me a wipe of the reference image I save in my gallery that we call an steel, and the image that we have in our timeline. Based on that, it is really fast that we can start matching these clips. We just need to go from here to here. In this case, from the green to the cyan. Max already told us the different behavior of these tools. So in this case, because I'm using a solid color, I'm going to use the offset. So all I need to do is to move this one from here to here. And it's already matched in color. But as you notice, there is a difference of lighting. So I can come back here to waveform and the one from the left is more light than the one from the right. So what I can do is here in this part, that is the one that modifies the luminance, I can go back here and I can match. And as you notice, now the two images are matched correctly. And I didn't use any memory of colors or something that I was remember, no. All I used was the scopes. And in this case, I use the color wheels. How can I do this with, let's think, with the bars that you can find it here? So let me save this, grab a steel, and let me take these images. And what I want is to become this purple color, this red. So what I can do is, again, select the white tool. Then what I can do is select here part eight. Let me put it like this, part eight. And then I can use the bars, especially the offset because it's a solid color. And what I can start moving, I can start moving them from here, one here, and the other one here. If you look at my face right now, all I'm looking is the parade. I'm not looking at the image. There you go. And now that are matches, I see what I did. And look, it's completely matched. It's completely matched. I didn't trust my eyes. I didn't trust the monitor that I'm looking. All I'm doing is using the scopes. And that is something you learn from this session uh, is the scopes are your friends. Usually when I start or when I start grading and so on, because in some way we think we are artists, we say, no, the scopes are something so scientific, something for engineers, something really like mathematics. Definitely no. The scopes are our friends. And they are the ones that help us to get resolved faster. So definitely it's like understanding the scopes and using the scopes will help you to go from one shot to another one. So that part is really important. So 
Okay, the first thing is we match using the scopes and the different options. Then what I usually do is, in this case, I like to put my playhead here and I play the image. And if it's already played, if already matched, it, it's going to, I mean, it's not going to produce any like jump in my eye. Okay, so I already matched these two parts. So let's think, how are we going to match these shots? So we can start grading in many different ways, many different ways. As Max say, we can start using color management. We can start using LATs. But if, if you are starting in color grading, I always think that it's important for you like to start using these tools and to get comfortable with these tools. I mean, using saying that, I mean like moving them and start like feeling the images and see how these tools behave in the image. So for example, if I want to start with this image and I think, okay, this is my sequence and I'm going to start grading this sequence. So the first thing is that I select a shot that is going to be representative for my story. In this case, I will select this shot, the number three, and I will start making a list, let's think as a hero shot, a shot that is going to be the one more representative for the story. Here, I can start using color management or a lot, but in this case, I will use the, the normal tools and I will start by this. The first thing I do oftentimes is move the offset. In this way, many Kevin shown that is one of my masters, show me, actually told me this, that moving this, you see how many light you have in the image, how many blacks and how many light. So start moving really, really strong. So for example, here I select that I need my image around here. Then I start using the gain or the lift. So for example, the first thing I usually do is to move the lift and I go strong, especially if, if you are starting, go strong and then reduce, then reduce. Why, why is happening that? Because always or never trust in your eyes, especially at the beginning. So when you are grading and you start like adding, adding, adding a bit part, the eye is getting comfortable. So when you are suddenly, your eye is getting so comfortable of the image, that you go away, you go to the bathroom and then go back again to grading and you see, wow, I did that. Yes, you did it. The eye likes everything what you are doing. So in this case, if you are starting grading, go with strong and then reduce. Don't go with zeros in the, in the scopes because that will affect the compression and many things in the image, but go hard and then reduce. Then again, go with the leaf, with the gain, go hard, and then reduce. So for example, here. And then move the gamma. Move a little bit the gamma, and then the gamma is so important. As you notice, for example, here I have one toy. I don't know if you guys have this toy when you were a child. I have it, and I actually bought it. So I always think that grading is like, okay, you. May you are here, you open here, and what is in the middle is the gamma. This part is the gamma. Always move the gamma, always move the gamma. If you are thinking that color grading is like making a hamburger, imagine that one bread, one, see, yes, one bread is leaf, another bread is gain, and the meat, the stick, the, is the gamma. So always move the gamma. So when you have already like the light, you say, okay, it's great. I have depth of field. I have my like, good perspective. You can also like put here in black and white if you want to, for example, make a better exposure. Then by double clicking here, you can reduce it. And then you say, okay, I have a first node. This node 
I will call it, I don't know, exposure. Then I will start like looking at us or making another node. Add node, add serial, and this one I will call it. So I don't know, balance. I can use it in one node, yes. I usually like to divide the processes, especially here. So what I can do here is looking at the scopes here. And usually, I I always think so. Here, I'm in a I'm always like thinking that this is light, this is color, and if I go strong, it's saturation. So when I'm using the wheels, the most less thing less more the most representative scope when we are using the wheel in color is the vector scope. It's a mixture between the vector scope and the waveform. But if, for example, if I'm going here and I'm looking at my RGB parade, the RGB parade is giving me red, green, and blue. But here I don't see red, green, and blue. I see the color wheel, and the color wheel is it will be more like HSL, hue saturation and luminance. So what I can do in order to put these two tools to talk the same language is to use the printer lights that you can find it here or the primary bus bars that you can find it also here that way if you move red you move red if you move green you will move green and this is something really important to think about it because if you are moving in the offset for example red here you are not moving red you are moving red with a bit of yellow or with a bit of blue. So you are not moving red. So this is one of my let's think, one of my things that I usually like to think is that when I'm doing the technical part, I use a lot of here. The I mean red, green, and blue. I use red, green, and blue. I use a lot. When I'm doing more the looks part, when I want to achieve let's think or uh, I don't know, a sunset color, I definitely use more here, these colors. So that's, that's something about it. Okay, so let's think, for example, let's go back here to the exposure and let's think, no, definitely I need more light. Something like this. Then I go to balance. And because this is a logarithmic footage, I will increase a little bit of saturation to have more colors. And what I notice here in this part, look at here, is that I have something really balanced. The whites are whites. The blacks are a little bit, in this case, reddish. So what I can do is go back here to the bars. And in the bars, I can reduce all of the red channel. So when I reduce the red channel, you can see what I'm doing it here. I can go strong and I can move it back. It's up to you. And I can, and here I'm balancing a little bit more the images. Also, there is something really important, like disable and enable. Disable and enable. Remember, your eye will like everything what you are doing. So don't trust in what your eye is looking, because your eye loves what you're doing. It, it, it can be something really horrible, but your eye lo love it. So always disable it, always disable it, and always try to make this. So now here, what I see is that I have a, a lot of like green. So what I can do here is move a little bit in the gamma, that is the, the mids in this part. And let's think that, okay, that I have a more balanced image and I'm ready like, to start matching the chops. So the first thing that I'm going to do is let me delete this one, is right click and grab a steel. So now I have a hero shot. Then I'm going to select this shot and I'm going to apply this shot, apply this correction of this shot, right click, and I can select apply grade. 
right click in the gallery and also I can say apply grade. Or the technique that I like more to use in Resolve is to use the middle mouse and click here and I apply the grade. Usually, for example, in this case, Max was the, the cinematographer here and I'm sure it was the same day, right? A similar time of the day. Yes, it is. It is in the same day, in the same um, morning, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Except that the shot in the in the skyline, the one in the in the last last shot, it was different white balance. That's why it's a a little All bit. Right. So this is really important because in many in many in most of the cases we don't know if it's the same day, if it's the same I don't know the same camera and so on. So we need to match it. We need to match them. The I mean, the viewer, the person in the TV will not care if it's morning, if it's afternoon, he wants to see everything match. So I grab the steel, and in this case, the reason that I ask Max is because when I copy the steel, this steel to here, it was closely matched. It's not completely matched, but it was closely matched. So then I come here and let's, for example, select here, and I will right click, apply grade, and definitely here something happened. And this is where we say, no, we, we need to work more. So let's start with these shots. So first I have this shot here. So what I like here in this part is if I press command or control, I can select both clips. And when I select both clips, I can choose this option that is called split the screen, but you can find it at the top left of the screen. And here you can see both clips. By default, it's versions. So you should select it, selected clips. Then I will start doing, you will notice that color grading is, in some ways, it's not improvising. You repeat the steps a lot. You repeat the steps a lot. So in this case, I will go first to the light, that is the exposure, and I will select the waveform here. And the best thing of this waveform is that the, when I have two images, the waveform will show me also two images. This is something really important. So then, let me put this bigger. I will start analyzing them. And I will say, okay, the blacks are deeper in my right image. Definitely, I have more, more meats. But this, this is because I have many leaves many plant leaves here in this part, so it's normal. But I need to increase the light because most of the meat in my images are here. But in the images that I'm working on, the meats are more here. So when I make this analysis, what I do is I start thinking of tools. I start thinking in tools. Which tool will allow me to increase the light in the meats? Is the tool going to help me? Is the, is the leaf going to help me? Is the gain, the curves? So when I start thinking on that, definitely I go, for example, in this case to the wheels and I will move the gamma because the gamma will move that part. So I will start moving it. Let me put this one a little bit here. And then I found a little bit of, I put a little bit more of light. Also, here I have one black, so I will increase a little bit the lift. There you go. And I will reduce a little bit. So now the light of both images are matched. Finally, what I do after like matching light in this part is that I start looking at them. I was like looking at them here like side by side but what you have to think is think think on max because max presentation at the beginning was great that he was telling us that the what is around us is going to affect the what we are looking at and the split screen is a great view i like it more because of the scopes i see both at the side but i don't like it here because i have something on the side that definitely will not give me like the the best like the best view to verify if the image are matched. So what I do after that is 
I select here the image, I select the wipe, I put it completely here, and I start pressing this one. So fast. The command is control in the keyboard is control W or command W. And I start doing that. And doing that, what I'm doing is that my eye is refreshing so fast. And I can check like the differences. And I can say, okay, they're a little bit much. But we already, or we just did light. Let's see in color. I can come here. And I can let's think in this part that we will use the vectorscope just to know. And when I look at the vectorscope, let me increase here. Here, my colors are going this way. In this part, my colors are going the same way, but probably because of the heat of the locks, I have this reddish part. So they are actually really similar. They are actually really similar. Maybe this one is going more to the green because I have many green here. So it's normal. So always, this is something that, that you have to take care of. Trust in the scopes, but always analyze what are the objects in your image because definitely it's not 100% mathematics. So it's like you have to analyze. So what I notice here, is that, okay, probably the light here or the color here are more going to the green than here. Also, a good tip is to check this part, the parts that need to be more balanced. In this case, this is a, let's think that this is, a, I don't know, something that needs to be gray. So I can come here and I can say, yes, here, this part is definitely more reddish and needs to be a little bit more balanced. So what I can do is come back here again to the bars and I can say, okay, let's move the offset, something like this. And okay, the red is here. It needs to be a little bit less blue. So I will move it a little bit here. Okay, something like that. So let's come back here again. And we will check here. I can use the same technique that Max told us. That is show picker RGB value. And here what I notice is that definitely this one has more of green. So what I can do is, for example, what you notice here is that I changed here the image because I looked that it wasn't completely balanced. But now I discovered that this one that was like my hero shot, probably right now is not going to be the end hero shot. So I need to also balance. So don't marry with an image because definitely you will improve that image later. And that's what I'm doing. I'm going to, in some way, balance more this part. It's, a, it's really red and green. So what I will do is go here a little bit. And there you go, and this one a little bit more. Okay, it can be definitely. Also, check here. This image has a, a blue sky. So the blue sky is going to affect a lot our scopes. So now, after I did that, I think, yes, definitely. This is better than what I have. So I will, again, grab a steel delete that one and i will say yes this image is better i was doing in some way i my eye got used to an image that it wasn't like the best references so i improve and then i start like looking again i will start looking and i say okay they are really similar right now i'm looking at here at the image in the interface that is not so i mean it's just one part of the of the screen but always make this in big screen. Always make this in big screen. And finally, after you think, okay, they are match, so what you can do is see it in real time. I will hit play.
and I can start feeling and I say, yes, it's good. And here also I like to do the, the editor technique is that to put the three fingers in my keyboard and use the JKL and I can start like feeling the differences. And what I notice when I'm feeling the differences is that probably there is more light in one shot than in another one. First, my eye told me, but then I need to verify that in the waveform. So, as you notice, there is more light here than in the other one. So what I do is I come back to the exposure and I can say, okay, let's bring a little bit more light here. All right. So I have this first two shots. Let's think in the third one. The third one is the same morning, Max? Or is it the afternoon? It is exactly the same morning, but um, I'm shooting into the directions of sunrise. And All the right. other one is just literally the other directions. <laughs> All right, that's good. But I mean, it's, it's our work. So let's let's think about, let's start actually with this one to see how it, okay, no, let's start with this one. So right click here and I will apply grade. And you will notice, well, no, definitely it's not the, something is wrong. So I will start with the light, same technique. Two clips, a split the screen. I can reset this part and I can say, okay, definitely I really had a lot of light. I move the offset here. Let me move the light, the gain and let me move here. Okay. And then I split the screen and I just looking at the, at the light. Okay, and I see, okay, right now they are a bit similar. Then I select my balance node. I will reset it again. And I will say, okay, I will apply a little bit of saturation, probably a little bit similar as here. I, I did some 60, let's see. So I will set here to 60. And you are start thinking, okay, Let's see how we can fix it. Definitely we have a blue sky here. And because Max was pointing here to the sun, we have a yellow sky here. So we are going to, okay, we can fix it. We can fix that with a secondary. So let's fix later a little bit with a secondary. But let's put a little bit more of saturation. Yes. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to check this in the parade. And what I look here is that this shot is really warm instead of these shots that are more balanced. So let me come back here and I can balance this shot in many techniques. I can balance them using the wheels, the primary bars, this one's over here, or I can balance them using also the tools that Max told us, that is the temp and the tint. So let's start moving the temp to the left and as you notice, here is a little bit more balance. So let's start checking here. I will add a little bit more of saturation. Okay, then I go come back here to the waveform and I will start looking at them. And I will say yes. I will move a little bit more here and maybe here. Okay, so now that I have something similar, I have to think, okay, now I have a problem that here I have a blue sky and Max here was pointing to the sun and I don't have that blue sky. So here is when you start thinking, okay, I use most of what I have in primaries. So now I have to do something here with the sky. And this is, something really similar as when I show you the pain in the rooms. That first, use the primary tools. But now you have to say, okay, I need to match this sky to this sky. 
not exactly much, but a little bit more. So when you're thinking in that small details, that's where you have to think in secondaries. So I will create one node, right click and create one node, and this will be serial. I will cut this node sky. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a power window. We are going to use power window in some other classes, but in this case, what I can do is I can create this one that is kind of a gradient. Let me show you here. If I click on the grid on the highlight button, this is a gradient. So what I'm going to do is apply a little bit of yellow, of yellow, no, of blue to the sky to match this sky with this one over here. That now, if I look at it, it's still a little bit green, this one, so probably I will fix it later. But let's think that is okay. So I have the still already saved it. I will come back here. I will look at here at my two side images, and I will go to the vector scope. Let me increase the vector scope. So the first thing that I'm going to do here is that I'm going to verify where where this, this part is in the vector scope. There is a tool here that is called Display Qualifier Focus. When you select Display Qualifier Focus, let me see here. No, it's not working. Okay, it's actually show you where the color is. So for example, in this shot, this color is around here. When I select this shot, probably my color of the sky is here. So I have to go or I have to move this to here to the green. So what I can do is I can go height. Look, I move really, really strong, really strong. And what I do is in the vector scope, I move it around here. What I think is the, is the, color of the sky of my Hugo shot. And I'm using the vector scope. I'm not using so much the sky. Now it's here. I And there you go. Finally, what you can do when you have here, you can like turn off, turn on, and check. And for example, in this case, I will increase a little bit more to see more of the sky. There you go, I don't want to lose so much. And you say, okay, I they are kind of matches. Definitely I have more color here than here. And also the vector scope is telling me, look, I have more color, but also the lack of color in this shot is because the same reason that Max was shooting at the sky. So we don't have so many color here. So based on that, yes, let's match this one. We still have time. Let's think that this is, Max already told us this is a wrong temperature. So let's see what we can do. Right click and we can apply grade. And we say mm, not working. Right click and we can apply grade. It's working a little bit more. I will reset this one. And one thing that can help you to, in some way to make fast this process is you can use this. Shift equal shift minus, and this will copy you the color from the clip that is one clip prior or two clip prior. And this will really help you in a speed up your process of testing. Because you can say, okay, let's just start with this one. I, I will delete it. Probably I will start, let's start with exposure. Let's look at here again. We can use the same technique, split the screen, or you can use just the waveform if you want it, or you can use, for example, here, this one, let me actually save this shot. I can use this one and I can say, okay, let's match these two both. And I say, okay, what I need is that this part of the, of the signal goes here. So I will reset it 
I will say, okay, let's move around here. That is where the meets are going to be that are going to be similar. And let's move the light, let's move the here, the blacks. Okay, something similar as what we have. Then put it in here. And you say, wow, it's, it was matching good. Then I will select my balance node and I will start checking, okay, is there a lot of color or is not? Definitely, this one has more color than this one, so I can apply a little bit more of color. Let me see at, at the balance. You can say that, yes, this one, let me check here. So for example, here, I, I don't see the, the blacks in this part, especially in the yellow. And this is something that you have to take care about it because you always see, always, oh, it's a good, it's, it's good to see where your signals go. So what I can do is I can increase a little bit more here just to know. And yes, my blues are lower than than the than the reds or the green ones. So what I can do is decrease this one and also move this one here. And then I can go back. Okay, a little bit like that. And if I need, for example, the blacks a little bit more down. I can increase here and let's move something like here. Let's look at the reference. This one is definitely, and our eye is telling us that is reddish. This one is more bluer. Let's look at this in the vectorscope in this in the RGB parade. And definitely the red channel here is slower than this one. So I can go to balance and I can say, okay, where is lower? is definitely in the height part. So I can increase a little bit here, but when I increase it, everything goes so, so red in the highlights. So I need to decrease it a little bit in the gamma. And there you go, it's getting more similar, more similar. And finally, remember, always it play. And you're saying, wow, yes, they are they are better match than when they were before. Definitely, I need to go back to this one and I need to start checking because what is happening in grading is that you have many shots and you start grading them. But if you lose the references, for example, in this case, what I notice is that this one is a little bit more greener than these ones that are over here. So I have two decisions. I need to become this one's greener, or definitely I can say, no, definitely this one is really greener, so I need to take a little bit down. So never lose your focus that you are grading a sequence and that you need that all of the shots needs to be matched. That's the main purpose, and that's the hardest thing in grading, that all the shots need to be matched, no matter if the cinematographer a change the Y temperature or the day change, everything needs to be matched. And you need to help yourself using primary, secondary tools. And one last thing that we did here was we use a node structure. We use a node structure, and this is something really important because you are organizing the way you work. And you know where to apply the tools and where or what to correct in each one of the shots. Such a great tip, Diego. Thank you very much. Definitely. It has too much because it serves like a glue to your grade, to your look. So when you are adjusting a creative adjustment on top of that, you will have much easier life to match them later on. Right? Yeah. yeah, definitely. Um, let me make myself presenter and um hold on a second. And let me share my screen again. So can you see my screen by the way? Yes. So 
guys, thank you very much um, for attending the webinar. And if you downloaded the PowerPoint presentations, you will see in the PowerPoint, there are some recommended books. And I really cannot recommend it you like enough to read this book, especially if you are beginning in um, beginning to learn about color grading. And in this books, this books covered like way much more than we are covering in this short two hours. And it really helps you um, in your career as a colorist later on. So one book is from Steve Holfish, The Digital Color Corrections. And the second one is book from Alexis von Herkman. And if I'm not mistaken, he also write the uh, Resolve manual as well, right? For a color yeah. um, page in Resolve yeah. 17. And another book, if you are in, uh, interested to learn more about how color can affect you emotionally. And this is a book based on a study from Patty Bellantoni. And it's such a such a great book and such a interesting readings. And um, another links that you can follow is that, you know, if you want to learn more about um, what a color space are, um, I don't think we can cover that in this short two hours. You can follow the link cinematiccolor.org and you will be able to download a, a white paper, a SIGGRAPH white paper. And in that white paper, you'll learn more about color spaces, um, display, uh, display color spaces, camera color spaces, the color spaces transformations, you name it. It's mandatory that you read that. <laughs> it's a really yes. good article. So we're coming to an end to our webinar today. And I really can't thank you enough for your time joining us. I'm really happy that you are all showing up. And the webinar will be recorded. It is already recorded and it will be uploaded um, to our YouTube channel. It's called Maxon Training Team. And it will be shortly uploaded um, in this YouTube channel after the webinar is finished. And um, yeah, uh, the Dropbox, sorry. And in, in the Dropbox, you can access the, um, the shared materials, the presentations and handout lives here, and then also the footage. And if you want to take certifications, um, Maxon certifications, for example, if you're using Magic Bullet Suite or something, um, any other Maxon product, Cinema 4D, uh, namely, you can go to Maxon slash maxon.net slash certifications and you can use the elementary knowledge tests these are free and you can use them as a memory jogger for you and don't forget to check out the next event the upcoming event in the maxon.net slash events and we will cover the creations of look since uh, in the in the pre-productions and in the productions uh, phase that is in the second sessions and joining us in the second sessions will be another um, guest speaker and I will all right I will share you with that now it will be um, Anthony Barry he's a filmmaker post-production consultant and also um, editor in uh, based in Los Angeles so if you want to learn more about shooting for the grade make sure that you join us next week same time same link and on that note i really um th i really uh, want to thank you for your participations today and um i hope to see you all next week thank you very much and stay safe take care until next week bye bye thank you everyone thanks max thanks everyone thank see you, you diego bye 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 have fun <laughs>